So the latest episode of my podcast, Rationally Speaking, was an interview with an economist named David Rudman. And we were discussing, uh, sorry to be overdramatic, but the rise and fall of microfinance. Microfinance basically was uh, this idea everyone was excited about 15, 20 years ago. The idea went, we can pull poor people in the developing world out of poverty by giving them small uh, loans. So we're not talking in the, the thousands or even necessarily hundreds of dollars here, but even tens of dollars, uh, a loan that they can then invest in, for example, a small business that could just be, you know, uh, selling things at, at the market, but something, uh, some sort of starting capital to help them get on their feet. Um, and then they can repay the loan. Um, so the micro finance um, institution can actually be sustainable while providing poor people this leg up, a uh, helping hand, not a handout to get out of poverty. And this seemed to really work for uh, a decade or two. Um, so everyone was very excited about it. And then in the last 10 years or so, 10 to 15 years, um, some more rigorous randomized controlled trials were done showing that actually microfinance um, did not seem to have any lasting effect on poverty. Uh, and this was kind of a, a bummer for everyone in, uh, in international development who had been psyched about it. And uh, you can go listen to the episode for more detail uh, on the issue. But I, I'm bringing it up here because I think this whole uh, discussion with David about microfinance turned out to be a great encapsulation of why I think randomized control trials are so um, important but complicated, more complicated than I think most skeptics or, or empiricists or rationalists uh, really understand. So I would say there's a few levels of understanding about ra randomized controlled trials. I'm being very simplistic here, but level zero is something like not even realizing they're important. Um, and I think most skeptics, empiricists, etc., aren't at that level. Level one is something like ra randomized controlled trials are uh, the gold standard of evidence. Um, and if you have a randomized controlled trial, you can trust it. And I think a bunch of skeptics are sort of at that level of analysis. The argument for that level is, is correlation isn't causation. Um, just because we had evidence that people taking out microloans, you know, 20 years ago were more successful than people who weren't, wasn't in itself, should not have caused the international community to update as much as it did. Because just for example, the people who apply for a microloan uh, are plausibly going to be more um, driven, more uh, successful, have more reason to believe that they can be successful than the people who aren't taking out loans. So that alone by itself could, could explain why we see them being more successful without necessarily microfinance having anything to do with their success. Um, so that's the standard correlation isn't causation argument. That's a very good reason for the importance of randomized controlled trials and an explanation for why those RCTs, when we did them about microfinance, showed something so different. Um, level two, though, I think is something like randomized control trials are flawed. And I, I, I think this isn't, point is not appreciated as widely as I'd like it to be. So uh, there's a, a couple reasons why RCTs can't give us the full story or a, or a completely objective story. One of them is just that it's just data. So there's a lot of important points about what's happening, what about the phenomenon you're interested in that an RCT won't capture. So for example, David talks about as uh, people investigated micro, the microfinance landscape more and more, they noticed that um, one of the reasons that the repayment rates on these loans were so high was that the women, it was often women who were, who were borrowing, uh, were under very intense pressure from the lenders to repay their loans. Often they were borrowing as parts of a group um, and the other members of the group would be threatened or penalized if any one member didn't pay back. Uh, and, and this caused a, a lot of stress for a lot of borrowers. Um, there were some uh, widely reported suicides, although it's hard to estimate just how many, um, from women who, who felt trapped by the loan that they'd taken out. Um, and so this was sort of a complication that isn't necessarily going to show up in an RCT unless, you know, you're like on the ground learning sort of the more qualitative, fleshed out story of what's happening. So that's just sort of a RCTs can't give you the full story uh, issue, but they can also um, give you somewhat of a skewed picture, um, even though they're randomized controlled trials. The issue that David talks about in the podcast is something called external validity. And that's basically the question of how much can we generalize about the real world or, or about the rest of the, the world from this particular example that we're studying in the RCT. And there's a couple of reasons why you might not have as good external validity, validity as you might like. One is that uh, there's a selection effect. 
even though it's an RCT, in that the kinds of organizations who are willing to participate in an RCT and randomize who they give loans to are not a representative sample necessarily. So some companies or organizations just aren't willing to uh, randomly withhold loans from poor people who need those loans uh, because they consider it unethical or, or whatever. Um, also, the kinds of businesses who are most likely to be willing to participate in an RCT are, David explains, uh, businesses that are, are growing really fast or organizations growing really fast. So they already have more people applying for loans than they can handle at their current stage, which is why they're willing to randomly deny loans to some people. Um, and those organizations growing really fast are not representative. Um, those are, for example, more likely to be areas that have a particular need for microfinance. Um, and so that's going to skew the results somewhat more. That's just one example, but you can probably think of other plausible reasons why uh, the, the organizations or, or entities participating in an RCT might not be fully representative of the, the full population you're interested in. There's another kind of external validity concern, and that is uh, that the process of randomizing takes out some of the effect that you're interested in looking for. Part of the reason that microfinance might work, um, if and when it does, is that the lenders, the lending organizations, are good at detecting who is going to benefit from a loan. And so when you, when you assign loans randomly, you're washing out that effect of lenders choosing borrowers who are going to benefit. And that's one reason why we might not actually see as much of an effect as there is in the real world outside of our study. So those are just two reasons why external validity might be compromised and why you shouldn't necessarily believe that just because a randomized control trial shows an effect or shows no effect, um, that's the end of the story full stop. Uh, level three, though, I think, is something that uh, at the end of the podcast or towards the end, I asked David, you know, should we therefore not update very much from these RCTs? And he said, well, you know, despite the problems of external validity, if you do a number of different RCTs in different countries, different contexts, and you get a similar story in each one, then you can start to be pretty confident about what your RCTs are detecting. And so the, the takeaway message here, you know, at level three is not RCTs are hopelessly flawed and therefore we can't use them. It's just, well, it's that uh, the world is complicated and science is hard. Um, but, you know, with enough uh, resources and rigor, we can actually get, we can start converging on an answer that we can be confident in. Um, and the, you know, the bad news is that that does take a lot of resources. Um, but that does seem to be where we're at with microfinance now. So this was just one sort of example of, of why randomized controlled trials are uh, necessary, but also flawed, but also important. Um, and I think there are a bunch of others, but this was a nice case study, I thought. Um, and if, you, if you're interested in learning more about the methodological questions and also just the object level, how does microfinance work? Why does it not work? What are some alternatives? Um, check out the podcast. Um, it's on our website, rationallyspeakingpodcast.org. And as I've said before, if you like my YouTube channel, I suspect you'd also like the podcast. So feel free to peruse our archives as well.